Um, I've taught um, courses on uh, entrepreneurial journalism in Latin America for a couple of years uh, at the um, Center for Digital Journalism in Guadalajara, Mexico. And so I have a particular interest in nurturing new independent media. And uh, I wish I had known about Source Fabric when I was uh, t uh, encouraging uh, digital entrepreneurs in Latin America to start their own websites because the tools that you have would have been very useful. Uh, as it is, um, I found that there is a tremendous thirst for uh, innovative new media, independent media in Latin America for all the same reasons that were mentioned um, by my colleagues uh, Kunda and uh, uh, D uh, David. Peter. Peter. Peter, because the, uh, in the traditional structure of the media in Latin America, you have these kind of oligarchic relationships between business people and politicians, and they're very tight. And the independent media threaten those tight relationships. And one of the ways that these oligarchy relationships control the media is by boycotting by, by means of uh, restricting advertising, or they pull the advertising. Uh, uh, one of the Mexican presidents had a famous saying, uh, I don't pay them so that they can beat me up. Uh, no les paga para que me, uh, uh, me palean. I don't, I don't wanna have them beat me up. And so um, part of what I'm going to talk about is some of the new experiments in financing models for journalism. Um, journalism, journalists have to be paid, and we have to find a way well. to pay them. And investigative journalism costs money, and we have to find ways to finance investigative journalism and community-focused journalism. So that's going to be my focus. The, in the past, we had this wonderful business model where uh, Walmart or a department store, which absolutely had no interest in the Baghdad Bureau uh, or in financing um, deeper coverage of uh, uh, corruption of politicians by a, um, a marriage of convenience uh, was connected with newspapers. It was a great relationship. It worked for about 100 years. It was immensely prof profitable, but it's, it's going away. And um, so what's happening now is that all kinds of new um, efforts are underway, experiments really, in how do we pay for high quality journalism, independent journalism that gives a voice uh, to the people. I'm gonna mention a couple of examples of people who are doing things that are supposed to be impossible, uh, but they've gone ahead and done them anyway. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's happening in the US and a little bit about what's uh, happening in uh, some other countries. And then finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how news media um, have to sell the magic. And when I talk about the magic, um, I'm talking about what David mentioned earlier about how with community radio, people feel very connected to the information. They feel very connected to the source uh, that is, bring, that is uh, speaking about their problems. And this, <coughs> uh, I know this might be a dirty word, but this has a business value as well because there are uh, sponsors and there are organizations that want to benefit from the close relationship that a media organization has with its audience. And this can be a source of support uh, uh, for independent media. And the, ind and the media don't have to lose their independence. They can still maintain that, that special relationship. This is um, Brian Stelter. Brian Stelter, for me, represents one of the new waves of journalism. Um, he was 19 years old when my business newspaper interviewed him and profiled him because at the time he was a college student at Towson University, which most of you have never heard of, but he was a 19-year-old with a mission 
and in his dorm room, he, he decided uh, in 2004, his New Year's resolution in 2004 was, I want to do a blog that covers how the uh, cable news networks are covering the Iraq war. So he began writing about what CNN was doing, what Fox News was doing, what C CS, uh, um, NBC, CS, no, C CNN, CBS. CNN, NBC. CBS. It was um, uh, MSNBC, MSNBC, I'm sorry, MSNBC, yeah. I'm sorry. And um, those three cable networks had particular slants on how they were covering the Iraq war, he wrote about them. He was posting 10 items a day. He very quickly developed an audience that included uh, people who were watching these cable networks, but also a very core and interested audience from within those cable networks themselves. He was doing it anonymously because he was afraid that nobody would trust it coming from a 19-year-old college student working in his dorm room. But after five months, a, um, he had a, developed a sufficiently large audience that uh, Media Bistro, uh, which is an aggregator of blogs, bought his blog. They started paying him a salary, and they asked him to cover not just these cable networks, but cover the major national networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS in the US, and again, because he was so focused on this and posting several times a day, he started to get all kinds of uh, news leaks. Um, the news executives at these stations and the reporters and the producers started feeding him all kinds of juicy stuff about what was going on. He was doing better coverage of the news, television news industry than any magazine or any industry publication, and he was doing it right now. He was publishing in real time. So uh, he, he won a, um, a, a prestigious award, and uh, it turns out that Brian Williams of NBC gave a speech and talked about how he reads Brian Stelter all the time. But Brian's 20 years old. Um, he's an independent journalist. He depended on his audience for news. He created something of value. He was uh, completely uh, focused on doing it to the highest standards of journalism. This, this guy, he was self-made. So for me, one of the messages is, if you can sufficiently, uh, if you can produce a, a high quality journalism in a, in a niche that's well-defined and create value, you will develop an audience and you, will, you can make a business out of it, as it were. He had, uh, when, he, when he finally left, uh, doing off, left off doing this blog, he had about 200,000 unique visitors a month and 900,000 page views a month. Again, he was a college student working from his dormitory room at a, at a university that most people have never heard of. So what happens? He graduates and the New York Times hires him as a media columnist which is what he's doing today. The Times never hires kids out of college. It just doesn't happen. But it happened in the case of Brian Stelter. Now he's got 85,000 followers on Twitter. And my question is, how much longer will he need the Times? He's got his own brand. He knows how to do the coverage. He could, maybe he could go on his own. He, he's such a nice guy, though, I'm sure he, he, he hasn't even really thought about that. But someone may make him an offer. And I also thought it was kind of interesting that um, my, my business newspaper published a profile of Brian when he was 20. Uh, and then a couple years later, the roles are reversed. Um, I'm going to Brian on Facebook and saying, Brian, will you be my friend, please, <laughs> on Facebook? So... So the new media. Big question, how do we get paid? One of the things that happens when uh, new media get l launched on the web is typically it's a couple of journalists get together. And uh, for any of you who play football or basketball 
or any other sport, you can't have all, well, if it were, we're talking football, you can't all be midfielders. Somebody's got to be a goalie. You need a goalie and you need some strikers. And if you're building a, uh, a news operation, one of the mistakes that I've seen happen over and over again is it's, they're all journalists. And none of them know anything about sales and marketing. And I know the, these are dirty words for uh, journalists, but think of it a different way, is we have to find a way to get paid for what we do. We deserve a, a dignified salary. So think about sales and marketing in a little different way. We're trying to pay journalists for the quality of the work they do. So you need three, three legs to the stool. You got to have the journalism expertise, you got to have the technical expertise, and you got to have the sales and marketing expertise. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have an expert in each of those fields. It could be a journalist who really has this wonderful technology piece in, in their head. Or it could be a journalist who has this wonderful sales and marketing instinct. When I was working at the Digital Journalism Center in Guadalajara, I had uh, two wonderful webmasters who, uh, I, I've never, I'd never worked that closely with a webmaster before, but they taught me so much and they helped me uh, so much in helping this center, which started from zero, uh, very quickly get a high profile in Latin America uh, as, a, as a leader in digital journalism. So you got to have at least those three roles. And of course, uh, when I wrote this on my blog, um, a designer sent me a, a message saying, you forgot to mention designers. And yes, absolutely. Uh, great design makes a great website. Uh, it makes it usable, it makes it pleasing, makes it a pleasure. Many entrepreneurs, would-be digital entrepreneurs, are unprepared. Uh, this is from a survey of some very serious digital news media in Latin America. 20% uh, of them had no revenue at all. 75% uh, were not covering their costs. And uh, more than half of them did not have a financial plan at the beginning. Uh, it's, it's not necessary that we have MBAs trying to uh, launch websites because the, if, with a, if you had an MBA, you would never do anything because you'd be too caught up in all the technical aspects. Uh, one, of, one, of the, um, one of the things I tell people is, well, rather than asking me you know, what my opinion of is whether to do something this way, launch it this way or that way, I said, just go ahead and launch it and try it and see what happens. I think that's the way you need to uh, work on the web, but you also have to have, it helps uh, to have some of the discipline uh, that you get from a financial plan, a market study, um, market research. Um, what What's happening now on the web is that we're, we're looking at the new financial models that are coming out include far more revenue sources than just subscriptions and advertising. And I, I do want to say at this point that we're living through a revolution and rev in terms of the financial models for media. And because, we're, because revolutions are really great at destroying things and not really very great uh, at restoring things and building things up. Uh, right now, things are in kind of a chaos and there are many experiments underway and some things are working and people are trying to find the new way, but it's a work in progress. There are no definitive answers, but here are some things that are working in some places. Special events can be very profitable for media. Um, when, when I was publisher in Baltimore, for the Baltimore Business Journal, we had probably one event a month um, for that, that was a event for which we charged admission and for which we obtained sponsors. Digital media can do the same thing because they have the same kind of intimate connection 
uh, that David was talking about earlier with their audience. They've created a community, small digital media or specialized media, they create a community. This community wants face-to-face -face contact, not just web contact. So they will pay to get together and, and have this experience. And there are sponsors who will pay to be in front of that audience. So special events are very important. And the Texas Tribune, which is a completely digital medium, is relatively new, two or three years old, They've made, a, they do a great job with special events. It has become a very important source of revenue for them. Premium content, we all know about the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times, which managed to charge people, uh, and they have a paywall. But I'll m I'm mention in a minute uh, an example of that from Costa Rica, uh, a financial site. Some media direct sa use direct sales. So, for example, the Telegraph has in uh, Britain has its own department store online. They've, they've basically cut out the middleman. It used to be they would run the ads for the department store. Now they've set up a department store online where you can buy shoes, you can buy clothes, you can buy housewares, you can buy whatever you want. Uh, and I don't know exactly how it works, but uh, small media can do it using something like PayPal, for example. Short message services for headlines. This also could take in uh, revenue from, uh, for example, an iPad app or a iPhone app. For some reason, people show a willingness to pay for an app online where they won't pay for digital media on a website. Memberships, Texas Tribune, um, as a, again, is a leader in this area. They have um, nine levels of membership, which, if you think about it, it, it's a kind of a subscription level that sells the magic of the subscription. I look at it this way. Time Magazine will say, here, Mr. or Mrs. Subscriber, you can have our magazine for a year for $50. Well, what Texas Tribune says is, we're not going to charge you to come to our website. However, we're going to offer you several different levels of potential membership from $10 a year up to $2,500 a year. So it'd be like Time Magazine saying, if you really, really like our magazine, you can pay $2,500 a year for our magazine, or you can just pay $50 a magazine. So they're selling the magic of a relationship and the support of an independent news medium. Um, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit more. Daily deals, you know about those. This is just Groupon and other sorts of things. Media, news media are starting to use that. Some uh, digital sites are selling their expertise in marketing uh, online, in creating media online uh, for other media. So rather than uh, sell advertising, they sell a service. Market consulting, web consulting, uh, we'll build a site for you and charge you, and that's what supports the journalism. Before, advertising or subscription supported the journalism, now consulting supports the journalism. There are a number of sites in Latin America doing this successfully. In the US and Europe, you have the tradition of foundations. Some nonprofit media are emerging with foundation support. Angels, millionaires, and then contract publishing. Uh, a guy I know in Mexico who has a pull up site on politics, it's called uh, The Respectable, El Respetable, uh, he does contract publishing, which means he produces print media for people who don't know how to produce a magazine. So again, it's a kind of a consulting relationship. This is the Texas Tribune membership model. Uh, if, you, if you're a student, you can pay $10 a year, and if, you, and if you pay $10, you'll get these benefits. You get to come to ha our happy hours, you get a bumper sticker, and so forth. If you pay $2,500 a year, you're a member of the chairman's circle, and that means you get invited to very special events. Uh, and so they've, 
very cleverly created nine tiers where you can, it's essentially like you can pay as much as you want for a subscription, as it were, uh, to our publication. This is the Telegraph shop I mentioned, newspaper is a department store, PayPal is an alternative. So they've cut out the middleman. They said, we're, we're not going to sell your advertising, Mr. Department Store owner. We're going to just, we're going to be a department store and we're going to compete with you. Um, data is a great potential business tool for media. I, I know business, it's an evil word. But think of it this way. Your data drives traffic. It could attract advertisers. Therefore, data is a, uh, is a business model. Uh, in the case of The Guardian, they've, uh, they put on their website the expense reports of members of parliament, and they asked readers to come and look at these expense reports and give the, the uh, reporters tips. They've um, they posted uh, 458,000 pages of documents, of which more than uh, about half have been looked at by uh, readers. Now you talk about a connection, a magical connection with readers, think about that. These people have gone to the website and actually examined dry documents, data, uh, and 27,000 people did that. You don't think that creates a special kind of relationship uh, and that that is something that can be, I'm going to say another dirty word here, monetized? That can be monetized. An advertiser would, could look at the numbers and say, these highly educated people, um, uh, this is an audience of highly educated, highly involved people. Don't you want to reach those people, Mr. or Mrs. Advertiser? And same thing with, um, again, I'm going to mention Texas Tribune. Texas Tribune, uh, again, a new completely digital medium in Texas, uh, put online the salaries of all state employees in a database, along with state budgets. They were surprised to learn that the traffic on the data part of their site was three times the traffic of their narrative journalism. That is, three times more people wanted to read dry data than their compelling news stories. Now, I know for writers, this may make you very sad uh, to learn that, you know, we didn't, you know, as a writer, that makes me sad that my compelling phrases and poetry uh, are not attracting as many uh, users as data, but that's a fact. In the U.S., what's happening is a, uh, a new media ecosystem is emerging. Small digital media either geographically or thematically focused. These are a couple of them. There's probably 60 or 70. Um, these are some of the best known. Here's a couple projects that can't work, but that entrepreneurs made work, which I, I find this inspiring and uh, uh, instructive. Okay, this is capitales.com. Who wants to pay money to find out about what's going on in the economies of Central American countries? Well, you don't have to have a lot of them, but if they're paying $300 a year for a subscription, you don't need a lot of them. So, uh, Carlos Mora de la Orden is a, uh, he's a financial planner with the soul of a journalist. He wanted data that was clean, reliable, uh, official, about companies operating in Central America. He couldn't find it. He created a, his own system of journalists to go collect it from public sources who weren't making it easy to, to get. And he publishes it on his website, which has uh, a sort of a, one part of it is open to the public, but a lot of it is behind a paywall, $300 a year. Uh, and these are companies that are listed on the five stock exchanges in uh, five Central American countries, Costa Rica being among, among them. And he also sells data 
that they collect to third parties, one of them being in London. In Malaysia, uh, several years ago, Premesh Chandran was publishing an independent uh, news site. He had the same problem that a lot of independent news sites have, that uh, he, you, know, you alienate the politicians and the big business people and they won't advertise on your site. So they were facing, they were at the point where it was, we're gonna go out of business unless we do something. So he came up with the idea of, well, let's, let's ask our readers if they would pay for the, for, the, uh, for the service, Malaysia Kini. They publish in Chinese, Malay, Tamil, and English. So they asked the readers, and the readers, 99% said, no, we don't wanna pay. Uh, but Pramesh said, okay, well, we're going to do it anyway because if we don't, we're, we're going to go out of business anyway, so let's charge the English speakers for the access to the English site, which they did. And that's about 5% of their readership. And they charge $48 a year, and they're still publishing. And now they're, they have a, over a million and a half unique users a month. So he didn't listen to the the survey, he, he just said, I, th I think we need to do this, we're gonna do it, they did it. Um, this is citizen journalism that's making money. Um, th their, their goal is not to make money, their goal is to create citizen journalism in Chile. And Jorge Dominguez is a social activist who went to Korea and saw the operation of Oh My News, which is a so it's a um, user-generated content website um, that has hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, users all over the world. And he thought, this is a model we should establish in Chile. Uh, they set up 18 local sites in, in Chile, which is, I don't know if you've seen it, Chile is a couple thousand miles long, and most of the media are concentrated in the capital. Uh, but they decided to create locally focused websites all up and down the country. Um, they're getting most of their revenue from a kind of a consulting business like I was describing before. They create websites for third parties and that's where they generate most of their money. They also generate some money from local advertising. But these sites, each of these 18 sites, has about four or five professional journalists, and they have a lot of user-generated content, and they cover topics that the mainstream media do not go into in detail. Human rights, indigenous people, uh, envir uh, environment, uh, gender, uh, topics that would otherwise be neglected. Incidentally, uh, in general, I think there are lots of opportunities for new digital media in areas of coverage like education and uh, human rights and environment and they can they can be sustainable operations in guatemala guatemala is a relatively poor central american or latin american country and uh, so why would you think you could sell a premium headline service via sms well they did it um they're generating about $60,000 a month. They have, they have more subscribers, or they did a year or so ago, uh, for, for the headline service. This is pure text headlines. Six headlines a day. The people who subscribe to the service pay four or five dollars a month. The phone company bills the people for this, and they give 30% to the newspaper. Um, for uh, El Periodico, which is a newspaper that is completely independent and regularly writes stuff that angers either the politicians or the business people who are in bed with the politicians. You have to have revenue sources other than advertising because at any moment they could pull the plug on the advertising and then you're out of business. So they, they did something that, you're, again, you're not supposed to be able to do. Similar with El Faro, uh, the, the lighthouse in uh, El Salvador. Uh, you have low internet penetration, but this uh, Carlos Dada and his team have managed to put together an interesting 
digital publication um, that gets about two thirds of its revenue from uh, non-governmental organizations. That's not really a business. It's, well, it is, yeah. And they also get supermarket advertising. You can see on the top there, Todos los Dias uh, Super Promociones, big, so you got a, new, a uh, supermarket advertising this investigative story. Así matamos a Monsignor Romero. This, this is a investigation of a murder of a liberation theology priest 30 years earlier by right-wing activists. And Carlos Dada searched for this guy for years and got the interview. They, they had like a million page views that month. Uh, so investigative journalism can be supported and you can find ways to do it. And then th this is an interesting non-digital but entrepreneurial operation. Uh, Justin Arenstein in South Africa was dissatisfied with the uh, coverage in traditional media and so he put together, he and some colleagues put together a co-op where the journalists write articles, freelance articles, and then the co-op sells the articles to uh, media. The idea is they want to try to sell each article five, at least five times to five different non-competing media, which means that the, the journalists can get financial support for their independent research, uh, and, and this organization provides a, a kind of a counterbalance to the news media that don't cover topics such as public corruption. Uh, at the moment, the, um, when they sell an article to a, 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 a news medium that's gonna use it on the web, the, the news medium has to pay them 25% extra. To be honest, I don't know how much longer an operation like this can, uh, can sustain itself because they're not on the web. They don't wanna compete with the media that they're selling the articles to. Uh, but Justin is a creative guy. I'm sure he'll find a way. Uh, the other thing that's happening is that uh, Google, for, for all of you uh, entrepreneurial journalists who are trying to sell advertising, Google just owns, owns the territory. They've got 75% of the search and ad revenue and they've got 12% of the display ads. And in the, in the online world, for any of you who are, uh, uh, everything is measured and there's numbers for everything. But you can't really compete with that. Um, what Google will tell you is, we're gonna deliver ads to your, uh, uh, what they sell to advertisers is, we're gonna deliver your ads to people who are interested in the topics. But it's all based on numbers. And, um, and when a machine is selling the advertising for you, the ad rates are pretty low. Uh, when, uh, when I was still active as a publisher, our, uh, we were selling, or we were getting about uh, $100, compare that to uh, $100 CPM, compare that to newspapers, second from the bottom, that, which is $7 per CPM, is about the going rate in the market today on, among digital media. Um, so it's, your websites are being sold by the numbers and not by the magic. And I guess what I would say is you need to sell the magic. And when I'm talking about selling the magic, I'm talking about f f with Texas Tribune, for example, selling the possibility of a relationship with the digital website at one of nine different levels, uh, not based on numbers, but based on people's feelings for the news medium. Sell the magic means sell to an advertiser. Don't use Google to do your advertising sales for you. Sell your advertisers on a relationship with a credible news medium. Um, so what, what you're saying is we're gonna, we are gonna put your product or service in an environment of a credible news medium, our news medium, and you're not gonna be part of 
just a data dump. We're, we're not gonna just uh, put your ad in front of somebody who has Googled independence. We're gonna put you in front of a, uh, a community that has an interest in high quality, credible news, and, and that we're gonna put you in front of uh, people who have a connection with the content that you're producing. That, this has a value that is not being measured by Google or any of these other uh, audience measurement technology companies. So, sell the magic.